Hi everyone, today we're going to talk about dispersions. Now, initially when I started this slide preparation, I was thinking, well, of course they're water-based. Food systems are typically water-based dispersions, but indeed there are many exceptions to this rule. Butter or margarine is a good example where it's not a water-based dispersion, it's a fat-based dispersion. And so most of the systems that I'm going to talk about will be water-based, but there are exceptions, so do keep that in mind. After watching this video, you'll be able to discuss the different states of matter and how they interact as dispersions, mostly in aqueous systems, but possibly in other systems. You will be able to discuss different interactions that occur between particles and dispersions, and using that knowledge, you'll be able to identify different methods to help stabilize dispersions. So what are dispersions? This is where we are mixing things together. And now, using chemical definitions, that mixture could be a true solution. This is where we're seeing a molecular level of dispersion, where the two substances are truly mixed together at a molecular level. Whereas when we think of dispersions, more often we're thinking of larger particles. Colloids are a good example, where the particles could be in the nanometer size range. This is where we see proteins or large molecules, um, very, very, very fine particles of lipids dispersed into aqueous systems. And then we've got coarse dispersions. This is where we're seeing larger in the micrometer, sometimes even millimeter size, visible to the naked eye. And this is where we're seeing larger particles dispersed through that system. Now, jumping into some chemistry before we get too far, I want to make sure everyone's clear about a couple of key terms. I'm going to be talking about hydrophilic compounds, and this is where we're thinking about molecules that have typically a charge, and they like to interact with water. This is not just one water molecule, this is two water molecules, and uh, when we see that little delta plus or delta minus symbol there, what we're looking at is that water has a partial charge. And so that uh, delta plus means that it's a dipole moment and it's imparting a partial charge on this molecule. Those partial charges are interacting with one another. So negatives like to interact with positives and vice versa. Negatives don't like interacting with negatives and they like to repel each other. So this is important to note. Now, other compounds are commonly hydrophobic, and you can guess the meaning of these words, jumping back here, hydrophilic. Hydro, water. Philic comes from the Latin root for love, so loves water. Hydrophobic, conversely, water and has a phobia for water or hates water. So hydrophobic molecules typically have a lot more limited partial charge within the molecule. This is a triglyceride, and this long hydrocarbon backbone has virtually no partial charge. And so as such, there's not a lot of charge-based interactions that are occurring in these molecules. This is why, again, water and oil don't mix, because of that lack of interaction between the molecules. But that said, how do we make salad dressing? How do we make mayonnaise? How do we blend water and oil systems together? So let's jump into some more chemistry here. Water is fascinating and fun in food systems because it exists in all three states of matter. It can be a gas, liquid, or solid. And we can see any number of combinations of these dispersions in place. And again, with those homogeneous colloidal or coarse dispersions as well. Let's also talk about some more terminology. In dispersions, we have a continuous phase, and that's the system that makes up the bulk of the dispersion. And then we've got the dispersed component, or in other terminology, we'll see a discontinuous phase, the particulate within that dispersion. Now, something that we're noting here is this 
particular terminology. O slash W emulsion. Oil in water emulsion. And note, water is the continuous phase. Down here we've got water in oil emulsion, and oil is the continuous phase. So be aware of these terminologies when discussing different types of dispersions. Now, again, we can see dispersions of any sort of state of matter occurring in food systems. Now that said, we do not know of any gas to gas dispersions that are occurring naturally in food systems. But we do see liquid aerosols such as fog or mist or steam off of foods. We do use smoke, which is a solid aerosol. So we have solid particulate suspended in air. Then we've got liquid foams. Think of meringue, soft meringue, like the type you would find on a, on a, on a cake or a pie, where it's uh, soft, it acts like a semi-solid, but the, it's, it's truly a liquid that's occurring in between. And that would be a liquid foam where the continuous phase is a liquid and we have air dispersed into that liquid. We've also got liquid liquid and this is where we have an emulsion. So for example, olive oil in a vinaigrette could be emulsified into a liquid liquid based dispersion. We've got sol. And this is a solid dispersed into a liquid. So chocolate milk would be a good example where you have milk protein. Casein protein is minimally soluble in aqueous systems. And so the casein protein is a solid dispersed in there. But we also might have chocolate cocoa particles dispersed in there. And those as well are solid dispersed into a liquid form. We can have solid foams, aero chocolate. I like chocolate, I uh, could go for some chocolate right now. That's where we've got a solid fat and we have air mixed into that in a dispersion. We could have a solid in a liquid, such as a gel, gelatin or auger would be good examples of this, where you have a solid component that's been uh, suspended and you could argue, is it is it truly a solid? Well, it's acting as a semi-solid because of the uh, gelatinization. And you could have solid sols, where you have solids dispersed in solids. So hard candy with inclusions. Let's say you have cinnamon mixed in there or um, cocoa powder blended into hard candy. That would be a s solid sol dispersion. Now, how do we see these particles interacting. Well, first and foremost, there is the aspect that those particles can't occupy the same space and the same mass. So there is an excluded volume component here. One bubble can't be in the same space as another bubble. That said, in another slide moving up here, they can coalesce, but that's not truly the same as excluding the volume that that gas would be taking up or that particle would be taking up. Then there's uh, electrostatic repulsion. In many cases, these particles will have similar charge. Now in certain food systems, such as proteins, proteins often have a partial negative charge, and those negative charges help to repulse each other. Negatives, again, don't like to interact with negatives, and so they're bouncing around, bouncing off of each other, and trying to repel from each other, but as soon as they bounce one off the other, they're interacting with the next one. So these could be from direct electrical charge or it could be from van der Waals force. That's that partial charge component that is seen in some molecules. Now, we do see entropic forces or entropy-based. Ostwald ripening is where you see a particle and bit by bit through molecular diffusion. This is, a, a, again, a visual representation, but molecular level diffusion across the continuous phase, we see enlargening and shrinking of some of the particles. So molecules will disperse to larger forms because those larger forms are more stable. We can also see coalescence. This uh, is a great example of shake shake some salad dressing and watch it. As a kid, I was fascinated to watch it 
on the kitchen table while eating my eating my salad. But coalescence is where we're seeing particles, um, they'll collide with one another and coalesce into a larger particle. So entropy can be part of that and part of uh, entropy can be through molecular forces and part of it can be just through physical forces. Um, we've been doing some work with emulsions in food systems and think of um, Think of whipped cream. If you whip cream, you can turn it into a foam, a liquid foam, where you have air involved in there. But if you whip it too hard, the fat will coalesce onto one another and you will see entropy, um, that fat coalescing. And you, instead of having whipped cream, you will have butter. And curds of butter will fall out and your foam will collapse. So that creaming out is possible due to too much energy being applied to the system. Now, steric hindrance is a great example of how uh, many emulsions are stabilized because uh, it's quite possible to have a surface active coating applied to the different particles. So for example, if you're making mayonnaise, you're whipping um, vinegar and oil together, but you're using the the lecithin from an egg to help with that steric hindrance. Uh, what we're looking at is a surface active compound or an emulsifier that is going to coat the particle. And that then imagine imagine these are the, they're sort of covered in yarn. Those particles, if they try and bump into one another for coalescence, they're physically burdened by the um, by the surface active molecules and they therefore cannot coalesce on one another. Conversely, you can have gel-based dispersion where you have a gel and the, the, the viscosity modifying agent or the gelling agent that's, that's um, modifying the ability of these particles to coalesce on one another is in the continuous phase, not, not specifically adhering to the um, the dispersion component. So again, thinking back to our systems here, we need to think if we're going to stabilize or create an emulsion, how are we going to do it? Well, most emulsions are done by sheer energy. So that sheer energy could be applied by whipping or mixing or forcing the solution through a small orifice when blended together with any of the different components um, that are there. If we are mixing in an emulsifier, it is important to think about the chemistry of that emulsifier and how it's interacting. Because again, what, what makes a good emulsifier? Well, we have to have a molecule that has both a hydrophilic and a hydrophobic component to it. So good emulsifiers have a good balance between those two different components, what's called the hydrophilic lipophilic balance hydrophilic hydro we remember that word hydrophilic likes water lipophilic lipo likes lipids so hydrophilic lipophilic balance we need to figure out what is the appropriate hydrophilic lipophilic balance for the system that we're working in to make sure that those emulsifiers are going to act appropriately in the system that we're trying to disperse now, hydrophilic lipophilic balance is taking the molecular weight of a hydrophilic portion of a molecule divided by the molecular weight of the total molecule, and it's multiplied by 20, and that, that's just arbitrary based off of the history of using this number. And it makes the number, rather than being a decimal, it makes it into a useful um, number that is codified for the purposes of formulation work. So hydrophilic lipophilic balance of less than 10. This is where we're seeing lipid soluble, um, lipid soluble emulsifiers. Most food emulsifiers are in this seven to 16 range. But that said, we're seeing more and more crossover into 
into pharmaceutical type applications where we're putting um, functional ingredients into foods for the purposes of fortification or creation of um, natural health products that look like foods or a good example here in Canada where uh, cannabis and cannabis bioactives are being emulsified into food systems. Again, most of the time you're picking something in this 7 to 16 range depending on the type of food system that you're trying to create. But there are times when you will want to be a bit more aggressive with the emulsifying agent depending on the application. Hope that answered your questions about dispersions and I'm ready for some chocolate now. That's a yummy solid foam. Take care, ask good questions and we'll talk to you soon.